Hi, guys. Welcome back to Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your show host, mm -hmm. Stefan Neff. Today is another fantastic day because I'm alive, I'm kicking, I'm above ground. And it is uh, so beautiful to, to just have another day of gratitude and just actually accept those things that, that we take for granted, accept them with a, with a you know, a pinch of gratitude. Uh, just something that that I recently realized I'm not not doing so well. I I'm falling back into the kind of let's get it done, let's get it done. And why are they driving so slow? And why are they 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 and thinking actually hold hold fire here, man. It is time for you to 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 take a spoon of your own medicine. You're telling others to do that. And so I thought I'd share that to to just say hey look it is recovery and living a healthy life up there and in there is all about little steps and so the little steps are so important so cool so just i throw that in there into our interview today um but i'm dead excited because i've got joseph tarovsky here with me joseph is the author of 40 thieves of saipan and um a Bit, a bit of a conflict of interest here. I'm a big history nerd. I love history, always did from, from the very first you know, teenager years onwards, because I saw, uh, I saw it initially as a, as a way of beating a teacher in his own game, which all of us didn't like, my history teacher. He gave us a test every single, every single lesson. There was a test to start off with. And that test was what was happening in the in the news in the last 24 hours that was the test and so he made us actually look at real history and we all hated him for it because it was a test uh, so i decided to beat him in his own game and then i got addicted to it to knowing more about history and learning more from those people who have been there not what the victors want us to know but actually talking to those that have been there and Joseph did exactly that in the preparation for his book, The 40 Thieves of Saipan. And I'm dead excited to have him on here. Um, now, don't, don't get too worried, guys. Yes, whilst we talk heavily history, yes. Um, we will also talk actually mental health and the mental health of, of, a, of a generation. That was the silent generation, a uh, generation that did not talk about the experiences in the Second World War, yet their mental scars caused often behaviors that down the line uh, was affecting the next generation quite heavily. So there's a flow on effect for all that. And that's what I want to discuss and maybe draw parallels to today, um, to the soldiers today that are returning from deployments in rather dodgy situations and they can't talk about it because they've signed you know secrecy uh agreements etc so there there are many parallels with those with what is happening today so let's dive into it joseph i'm so happy that you're a guest on my show thank you so much for coming well, thank you Stefan. appreciate it mm. i read your book and it is one of those beautiful books that I literally couldn't put down. So I started reading at it and I thought, oh, that's quite specialized, one little aspect. But it was an aspect of the Pacific theater in the Second World War that I had not as much appreciation about uh, in Saipan. And I thought, okay, what was Saipan? And oh, okay, oh, maybe I should read that book um, just for completeness sake. Oh boy, was I in for a ride when I then actually started reading it and and uh, saw really what was what was going on. So it was a beautiful journey for me, and there were many points, especially in the later a third of the book, where I said, "Damn, I need to get in touch with this guy." And so I read your book first. And then I, I looked you up and said, okay, well, how can I find him? And I was so pleased that you actually replied and let me connect with you. But let's start with your journey. And let's start with your journey, literally, because it all started really around about 2011, wasn't it? With, unfortunately, the death of your father. Shall we kick off from there? How, how, when was the first time that you realized that your father might have been living 
not a double life, but had a secret life that no one ever really talked about. Certainly, it uh, all began at his funeral. You know, certainly, I knew he was a Marine in the Pacific for many years. It, you couldn't hide that fact. He's a retired colonel. He'd go to reunions and things like that. But if uh, in conversation, the topic of Guadalcanal or Tarawa, Saipan, Tinian ever came up, it would be squashed immediately. Um, but at my dad's funeral, this fellow got up to speak about dad's tenure as mayor. And that, uh, that all made sense. But then it took this little sort of left-hand turn about how the first time that he met my, my father was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And this fellow at that time, he was a kid, he was in Naval ROTC. And dad was going at that time on the GI Bill and it, he kind of stood out down in Madison because he was old. He was in his 40s and this kid was, was 18. So he stood out on campus. Um, but when this kid would go to these ROTC meetings, there'd always be a Marine sergeant there who was, you know, in his dress blues, crew cut, every inch a Marine. And if he had occasion to say your name, he would just bark it out. But one day he sees this surly sergeant talking to my dad and they're laughing and joking. And uh, it was a very uncharacteristic to see the Marine that animated. Uh, and he really didn't think anything of it, except he saw it happen a few more times. And at last he went up to the, the sergeant and said, excuse me, how do you know Frank Tahovsky? And that sergeant snapped back, that's Lieutenant Tahovsky to you. And when you speak of him, do it with respect. He was our platoon leader on Saipan when an enemy tank broke through our front lines, and we had no weapons to fight it with. The tank kept advancing, and we all thought we were goners. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a solitary figure runs out into the field of fire, uh, shoots a bazooka, disables the tank, and kills the crew inside. That was the lieutenant. He saved my life that day. He saved the lives of every man in our platoon. Every day of my life is a bonus because of that man. So when you speak of him, do it with respect. If a pin dropped on the carpeting, you would have heard it. Um, and that bit of eulogy is what prompted me to first do an online search of our last name, Tachowski, and Saipan. And then up popped this Marine Corps website with an article from the December 1944 Leatherneck magazine entitled Tahovsky's Terrors. And it spoke about the scout sniper platoon on Saipan. And beneath it was a little text from a fellow named Chris Tipton. And it said, this was my father's platoon during World War II. Everything in the article he said was true, except they were never known as terrors. They were known as skis 40 thieves. So even before um, there was even a thought about writing anything, the title was staring me in the face. So then I opened my dad's footlocker, which was kept in the garage, uh, no one ever opened it. And if I ever saw dad going through it and I walked in the room, he'd immediately close it. And it was a treasure trove of, of history of that time period. Every letter that my parents exchanged was in there. Uh, his uh, platoon rosters for Guadalcanal, Tarawa, and the scout and sniper platoon on Saipan. Um, with even handwritten notes on it of the two army fellows that we'll probably get into later that went AWOL to join the platoon for the invasion of Saipan. And the list of who was wounded on Saipan and who was killed on Saipan. So I immediately you know, went down the list of names and first name that popped out was Tipton Warren H at the very bottom. So that was Chris Tipton's dad. His name was on the roster. And then also a uh, name Knuppel, William F, Sergeant. 
And Bill Knuppel was always a Marine buddy that my dad and I would visit when dad would snowbird in Arizona. And, uh, and it's, it wasn't, I didn't think it odd at the time, but in retrospect, I understand it now that anytime Bill would try to talk about the war, he'd just say, Bill, those days are over. And Bill would just tacitly comply. And, and it, it now occurs to me that even as 80 year old men, they still had this relationship of Sergeant to Lieutenant. And, and uh, after dad passed away, I started talking to Bill and he, as opposed to dad who never talked about the war, he was like a Marine Corps energizer bunny who would tell you anything and everything. He recounted it. He'd written a little book himself called Semper Fi about his whole Marine experience. Um, he uh, gave me photographs and, you know, stories that he had typed out like meeting Arello and Dooley. Um, when they went on leave in Kona, he and Don Evans and the two army nurses. And, and after talking to Bill several times and sort of accumulating that, I wondered what, I wonder who else is alive in the platoon. And I found three other men. And that's when the journey began of just talking to them and gathering their stories. And, and that's, that's, the journey that it's, it's actually the story is still being written because people are finding their father's name on the cover of the book uh, uh, and then contacting me. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So, so in a sense, the story is, is still being written. Um, and after all, it is the, a story, it is a story that has been hidden. That is, it is, that would have, you would have never started finding it had not uh, the U.S. military tried to sort of beat up the the demagogic, the the, the word smithing, the horror of of Saipan. See, that's what our soldiers are to the enemy. Um, mm -hmm. So that was how they were portrayed, and and probably quite rightly so. Let's be quite clear about that, and we come to that. But it is um, it is quite unusual this story because you have found very clear evidence and the other unusual thing is that people have actually kept it um all i i cannot find anything military history wise from any of my relatives because everything would have been burned or shredded or done whatever you could have done at the time because it was a shame it was it was you know therefore it is so beautiful that you have got the primary sources there which is is Wow, you're such a lucky man. Well, even uh, uh, Alma Smots, Bob Smots, who was one of the three gentlemen that was still alive from the platoon, said to me, he's never talked about this to anyone before. And I think it's you know only because, one, I was their lieutenant's son. They all said, you look like your dad. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the other thing was from Bill Knuppel, um, I learned so much intimate information about the platoon, like the pig roast, like Arello and Dooley, um, certain guys' habits that you would only know if you'd been there. And I think that made them feel at ease to, you know, open old wounds and discuss more intimate things about their service that... I think it was Roscoe Mullins said that, you know, unless you've been in combat, you don't know what it's like. And that's why these men didn't talk about anything. Um, you know, Bob Smots just said, killing is nothing to brag about. And that's all these men did for two years of their lives in the Pacific fighting a very brutal war against a, a warrior race that would not surrender. So it was much more intimate and horrific than, than war, which is already intimate and horrific. And we need to, to go into two things. Let's go first a bit Saipan, actually talk quickly about when this all happened, because we are talking 1944, June, July. That's really the time period of the, the Battle of Saipan and uh, the build up sort of in, in the start of, of 44. Um, things had 
finally turned the corner in the Pacific. The, the whole war had started for, for most of, of the world in 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland. America's, America, oh, the United States, was sitting a bit on the sideline until the 7th of December 1941 with Pearl Harbor. So that's where suddenly America was thrown in big time. So unfortunately, the, the Japanese juggernaut had gone through the Pacific, bang, 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 bang. Singapore, yeah, we take that. Uh, Philippines, yeah, we take that, et cetera. And they were basically sitting on the, on the doorstep of Australia, uh, bombing the northern part of Australia and, and trying to figure ways, well, how do we get in there? So that's, uh, that's how far down they have come. And then suddenly the, the tide turned uh, with some, some uh, big battles midway, uh, Guadalcanal, those kind of things happened. So the tide turned against Japan. They, are, they were just so overcommitted in their supply lines, etc. It's very, It was hard to, to, to keep such an empire going. Having said that, they were a warrior race. And when we come now to 1944, basically their whole expansion was, was coming back together. And now actually the movement was coming closer, closer, closer. And they came to a point where some of the really, uh, the, the most important military installations needed to be held at any, at any price. And Saipan as an island was exactly that. It was basically the thought, if that now falls, then hell, they're on their way to Tokyo. And that's not what we can do. So here was a warrior race that looks very derogatory down on giving up. And now you add to that the fact, actually, hey, the enemy is about to go after our wives, children, and parents um, in because the next step is, well, one of the next steps is, is home. So there was, there was a very good incentive for the Japanese to be the cruel enemy that they were. So that is that is the setting in which we are which we are now. You have got um, the American soldiers who know war in a very brutal way, especially in the Pacific. But now you come, you rank it, you you wretch it up to the next step to some really nasty things. So, and when I say nasty, so that is the Japanese side, and the Americans decided to fight fire with fire. So what was so special about the US Marine sniper platoon that was being put together to go into Saipan? Well, there were only two such platoons that were deployed in the Pacific during World War II. One was for Tarawa, but Tarawa was just a 72 hour bloodbath. I think there were 5,000 Japanese killed and 2,000 Americans killed and wounded um, on an, in an area about the size of Central Park, all within 72 hours. So there were no front lines to, to work behind. Saipan was going to be different though. Saipan was the first link in the chain of Japanese islands, as you mentioned, that would lead to Tokyo. And it was a rather bold move. The Japanese knew that at some point, uh, Saipan would be a target but they didn't think that the uh, US or the allies would strike as soon as they did, which is what took them off guard. Um, because it was miles uh, behind, or miles away from any other installation, allied installation, um, but the acquisition of it was key to winning the war in the Pacific, or at least speeding it up, because the, the Marianas had two of the finest airfields in the Pacific, um, Esleto Airfield on Saipan, and then the Ushi Airdrome on Tinian, and that's where the Enola Gay uh, departed from in August of uh, 45. Um, so it, its acquisition was key, and as mentioned, this, there are two, two such platoons that were deployed in the Pacific during World War II, and the Saipan scout snipers were trained to live and work behind enemy lines for days and weeks at a time, uh, mapping installations, um, making maps, getting information back to headquarters to help uh, locate um, airstrikes and uh, other uh, artillery bombardment, and to wreak havoc where they could. 
So they were, I, I always think of them as grandfathers of the Navy SEALs, really, and, and what they were trained to do, which was different than, than other, um, other units in the Corps. And um, Peter Senich wrote a book about the scout sniper platoons of World War II in Korea. And uh, I found it funny that in his book, he has many pictures of the guys from Saipan, but he didn't know their names. <laughs> so it's just two scout snipers on Saipan or another group. And, and I can name almost every one of the faces of the 40 guys in the platoon. <laughs> and that will we come to that in a moment because that says so much about the, the people who returned home. Um, Let's call them, though, what it is. So these were indeed Navy SEALs, but uh, nowadays the Navy SEALs have got more sort of pinpoint, okay, you're going to go after this uh, this target. We want to know as much about it as possible, and then get back out or go in there and take the target out. It is a bit more surgical. Yours, the what your dad was trained to do was essentially what I would call with, in honest words, an assassination squad. Um, these guys went in there to cause terror, to cause horror, to actually unsettle the Japanese and basically soften them up, so to speak, with any means possible. And that is what the training really reveals. Because as, as some of the men said, they had been trained in killing uh, in ways that you can't even imagine. Um, that was one of the sayings, and that taught me a lot. So this was far more than bayonetting and shooting. No, they all carried a piano wire um, with, with two pieces of wood that, uh, um, uh, how did they call it? Uh, the, a mafia necktie. Thank you. That was what I was thinking about. Exactly. So that is that says a lot. That is a different way of soldiering than you would normally expect. So therefore, these men were trained to be as brutal, as ruthless, and as as you know, rip them apart and leave the pieces so that the other Japanese can see what they are up against. That was their task. Yes, intelligence well, it, gathering, etc. But you know, bring it into the into the Japanese lines. Um, tell, give them a right. bit of their own medicine. Right, but it it wasn't um, go in, shoot them up. They had to learn these silent killing techniques because they literally had to move like thieves in the night. Absolutely, you know, go in, go out, be as quiet as they possibly can, and wreak that havoc. So it's uh, sort of a, a sidebar to, to you know, their their mission was to be quiet and deadly. Exactly right. In fact, they carried a specific knight, uh, knife, pardon me, that was a, a raider stiletto. It was named after the raider battalions uh, that were on uh, throughout the Pacific in the early years that uh, was made to kill silently. That's the description that I read about the Raider stiletto, and it was so finely honed that if you dropped it on its tip, it would shatter. Mm -hmm. That's indeed right. So very, very focused, and and every every piece of equipment they carried was very was very clearly intended to wreak havoc. And let's be quite clear: if you're two, four, eight men behind enemy lines you don't have have the luxury to mess around so let's let's actually get that clear if you want to go if you if you have to make contact then you are making contact as always it, against such overwhelming odds you know it is okay you need to be silent as a thief in the night that's exactly what these men were so it is an amazing amazing story because if you imagine the, the emotions that must have run through these men the level of fear the level of of maybe disgust of themselves maybe of uncertainty i mean these were all young men we are not talking hardcore soldiers that were trained there for years without end because that's what their career is 
No, these were young men who, what was sort of the average age of the, the men in Saipan? What would you guess? Uh, 19, 20. Exactly. I, the oldest guy might have been 22 and they called him Pops. Just exactly. because he was two years older than everybody else. <laughs> okay. So you've got essentially, for the lack of a better word, uh, kids. Now, kids right. that had to grow up very, very fast. And it is one thing now for us to talk about it, uh, about those kind of brutal things. For them, they they didn't talk. They didn't talk about their emotions. They just did it. And that is the brutal thing. I jump a bit ahead there. But of those men that came back, those who suffered PTSD, well, that was actually 100% of the unit. Everyone suffered PTSD afterwards. And that was a statistic that put my, my, that gave me goosebumps. Because again, there was no appreciation of that. There was no, there was no um, transition support for the soldiers that came home. No, these were absolute trained killers. And literally in this case, trained killers. That's what they did. That's what they did very well because they survived. That's the proof and it lies in the pudding. And yet here you are, they came home and, and being very different men. It's an amazing, amazing thing to actually consider. Did you have, when you look back now with all the, the material that you accumulated about your dad, do some of his, does some of his behavior make sense? And I'm not relating now to the footlocker that he wanted to keep close to hide things right. from you. I mean, the way that he maybe talked to you. Was, was he a strict disciplinarian as far as you were concerned? Not, not really. Um, I, I think my mother and father had a difficult time of it because they were married before the war. Yeah. And my father would always say, um, or maybe it was in a letter, that no guy is ever the same when he comes home from war, to be in direct contact with the enemy killing uh, changes a person. Mm. Um, Bob Smots, uh, his wife, and I don't know if my mother really adjusted to it well, because these guys, you're supposed to go over and, and live like an animal, you know, killing for two years, three years. Mm. Uh, they were married, he went off to war, they didn't see each other for two and a half years after that. So basically the woman that my, uh, pardon me, the, the man my mother married wasn't the man who came home. Absolutely. And without the support and things that we know today, um, I don't think she really grasped it. And once again, you can't, imagine what someone would think of you if you told them, what you, you did, actually did during the war? What, uh, what, what image do that portray to okay. the normal person? Which is why they, they don't talk about it. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, Alma Smots, Bob Smots, widow, wife, widow, she, he's, he passed away just two years ago, um, took me aside one day and she said, uh, early on when she was uh, just gotten married, She'd wake up at night to find Bob choking her mm, exactly. because he was having the same nightmare that he told me about. It's uh, in the book. I was able to incorporate the nightmares that the men told me, except for Bob's, because his nightmare happened on Saipan when his best buddy, he watches his best buddy, Daniel Kenny, die. And then he starts chasing, Smot starts chasing the Japanese through this, you know, elephant grass. And he catches one of them and they engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's his nightmare. So he's choking, he wakes up, his wife wakes up and he's choking her. If you're an 18, 19 year old girl, what are you gonna think? What are you gonna do? I, you know, she deserves all respect and, and, true love for Bob in that she, she understood and she learned early on to recognize 
the early warning signs that he'd be having his nightmare, because it would only happen once a night. And she could wake him up before, you know, anything happened. And, you know, what has been enlightening to a lot of the uh, people from the platoon, sons, uh, daughters, contact me after seeing their dad's name on the cover of the book, and then they buy it and read it. And it, they so much better understand their fathers now after reading that book as to why they were the way they were. Um, a fellow in, uh, I believe it's Alabama or Arkansas, contacted me and said, you know, my father was in your platoon, but this fellow's name was Bill Marshall. There's no Marshall. In the, on the platoon roster. And then, um, and, and I'll just segue for a minute, there was a fellow in the platoon named Albert Malanga, Italian. So on a lot of my uh, posts, I talk about what it was like to be an Italian American in the 30s and 40s. And it wasn't as glamorous as it was in the 50s when you had names like Sinatra or Martin or Martini or what have you. Um, the greatest mass lynching in US history was a bunch of, I think 14 Italian Americans in Louisiana around the turn of uh, the, in the early 1900s, late 1800s. But people hated them because of the darker Mediterranean skin color and Catholicism. So I talk about this prejudice against Italian Americans, you know, uh, when I mention Albert Malanga, uh, when I mention him. And it turns out that Albert Malanga found the discrimination so great that he changed his name to Albert Marshall. How am I supposed to know that? And he just passed away this last December. So the biggest kick in the pants that I've ever felt in something that is the greatest regret of this whole project that I didn't know that. And I had another source to talk to um, about the, their experience. What you describe is so normal for me to hear, because if you think back that prior to World War I, 10% uh, of the American population had German descendancy. So they were, uh, their ancestors were German. Suddenly, it was no longer to be cool to be German. So a lot of German names got anglicized and a lot of uh, stories disappeared and people shut up about that. And the same was then happening again after the Second World War, when there were a lot of, um, some of the Germans were brought across paper, Operation Paperclip. Um, where people, regardless of their roles during World War II, were deemed so important in the Cold War that was building up that the Americans actually, you know, cherry picked and said, now we have you, um, et cetera, regardless of who you are. And sometimes the names got changed there as well. So that is something that happens again and again. And it is, uh, that's, but can you imagine that background to actually be such an oppressed minority and now going into war and actually proving yourself. We see that from many Jewish men who ended up in fighting in Germany, they, for them in the first world war, for example, they fought, yes, all those programs and other, all those, uh, this, this anti-Semitism, we can prove that we are German. We can prove that we're on the battlefield. So you had all these kind of, of things happening in those minds of these young men who could suddenly spread their wings and show themselves as, as men and be proud of who they were. So there's another complete different component of, of why they why they they felt such a such a, such a such an attraction and why they 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 what this brotherhood really meant for them, the brotherhood of warriors. Uh, for someone who grows up under diff under very mm, not so nice circumstances, that's suddenly a family, um, a family that they never maybe had, and and uh, respect uh, that they never had prior to that. So that's a completely different story that I had not even clicked upon. But now that you tell me that, yeah, and you know, uh, this PTSD uh, 
situation. Bill Marshall told me about an episode when he was in college and he was on the football team and he was, you know, 19 years old, cocky, Albert's kid, Bill. Um, he said something that clicked in his dad and his dad picked up a butcher knife and pointed at his son and said, you better not fall to fall asleep tonight. And Bill Marshall knew that he should get out of that house right then and there. And uh, at some point in my discussions with Bill, I said, you know, I know that episode happened, but you know, I'm so happy that your father was able to cobble together a life after the war and have a family. Um, so many men from the platoon who were married before or shortly after the war just suffered divorce after divorce after divorce. Mm. Um, one of the fellows, Maurice Malin, was arrested several times. You know, in the book, they steal a Jeep, an army captain's Jeep, and that's all fun and rakish, but you do it in real life uh. and it's a cab, you're going to jail. Wandering streets, you know, drunk and naked. You know, you can you can be Don Evans and shuffling across the ledge at the Kona Inn trying to find some army nurses and be, you know, buck naked. But you do it in a in a street in uh, in Buffalo, New York, and you get arrested. And uh, in fact, Bob Smots said, you know, when he first got to come home, they sent him to uh, Mare Island for rehabilitation for a while. And I said, well, what was that like? He said, well, we ate pretty good. Because when he came home, I think it was 120 pounds mm. because of the poor food they found. I wonder how, how these guys ever had energy to, to go into battle with the diseases they had and the lousy nutrition that they had. Um, but he said, basically, they told us if, you, if, you, if some civilian um, angers you and you kill them, you'll go to jail. That was it. And and then after that, they get put on a train and sent down to San Diego. But before the train leaves um, in San Francisco, they get some hop the fence, steal some booze, and they get, as Bill, as uh, Smots would always say, rip roaring soused. And uh, so when they got to San Diego, they were asleep. And the railroad men, you know, got some MPs to get them out. And the MPs saw, they must have had a scout sniper patch on them, a designation. And the MPs saw that and said, oh no, we're not waking them up. You just unhitch that car and you let them sleep. Because waking them up while sleeping was not a good thing. And, and I've heard this from many of the children on how they tried to wake up their dad and all of a sudden they'd be through the bedroom door, you know, lying on the floor in the hallway because of the reaction. You never wake a sleeping Marine. Can you imagine? Bloody hell. Bloody hell. It is. How do you explain that to a little kid who's just, uh, you know, going to get daddy in the night? That was Sandy Strombo's story. I think she was an 11 or 12 year old girl. Somebody called on the phone. And uh, she went to wake her dad, and bam, she's you know out the door, yeah. sitting on the floor in the hallway. And, and imagine the regret I know. of of the fellow who does that. Exactly. God. And all of these guys were just to come home and pretend as though nothing had happened. Uh. Some did a better job of it than others. Uh. You know, Mar Marvin Strombo did. My dad did. Bill Knuppel did. Bill uh. Knuppel was a uh, going to be going to the Olympics, but had two daughters. And it must have been the 48 Olympics. Um, uh, as, and as an older guy, he was going to qualify for the Olympics for swimming or sprinting or whatever he did. All of these guys were great athletes. But he had two daughters, and his wife walked out on him. And instead of going to the Olympics, he decided to raise his daughters instead. And we need to put that into perspective because you you sort of see the pictures of the American wartime industry, everyone working together, brilliant. And then 1945 comes and then suddenly there are no jobs. There are a whole bunch of men who have come home with the most terrible memories and all the emotions that go with that. 
and they tried to reintegrate into a society that they had not known. Suddenly, the women were far more resolute because they had been bringing up the family alone. They had been working for themselves. There was an emancipation going on that they probably thought, what the heck is happening here? Women suddenly flying aeroplanes, you, you what? And so that the cultural shift that they noticed, wow. But here they were from extreme type A, toxic masculinity, really, um, what we're talking about, to come home, to be completely castrated. You're not worth anything. Look, you're an alcoholic who is running naked over the, the road. You can't even hold down a job. So the, the goalposts have completely shifted. And even if they try to reintegrate, they have got great difficulties doing so because there is nothing to, to, to keep up those uh, the, the positive feelings uh, of however bizarre they were uh, in this brotherhood. They are ripped apart. They are now alone. Have to re 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 find, or actually not find themselves. They were young boys when they left, and they are now very different men. And they have to find a new life. And there were no Tony Robbins courses. There was no. <laughs> there was no appreciation. There was maybe even just maybe some mention of shell shock in World War One. And maybe, just maybe, if they were lucky that their dad had been uh, in World War I, who could maybe give them a little bit of insight. But that was about it, was it not? There was no structure. No, and, and, and shell-shocked was, was not the same thing. or It wasn't perceived as the same thing at that time. You, you'd pretty much lost your mind, you know, mm. by, by gone nuts. Like the, like the character in the book, um, Lewis, um, he was an actual fellow in the platoon, but no one ever wanted to mention his name. No one wanted to call it out because they knew that it could just as easily have been them that lost it. Because that constant shelling and strain on your mind, I think Bob Smott said, you had to focus really hard on not going insane. That's so true, isn't it? That's so true. And you, we will never be able to imagine the fear of unrelentless combat and combat where you are powerless. But because when, when shells rain down on you, that's fuck all you can do. That is, you know, it's it's a matter of, will that shell get me or will that thing get me? No, no, you're lucky you're still here. Uh, well, is that really luck or is that, a, <laughs> is it a good that I'm still here? For Christ's sake, God, take me um, because I don't want to take it anymore. And so on. There's all these kind of things, these emotions, emotions that go to the deepest, darkest core of our being. And now you go home and have a good time. We love yeah. you to be home, but we actually don't. We don't. We, we actually, yeah, thank you for your service. Now fuck off and then just drink down there in the other other corner there. That is, we don't want to know. I know you. And that is so hard because that's, you were referring already to the Korean War. For those of you not so into history, that was five years later, 1950 to 53. Mm -hmm. So you had basically this period of five years where these men were decommissioned and were basically trying to make it on Civic Street. And surprise, surprise, as soon as Korean War came, yeah, we are back in. And that's the reason that you have got all these men who, who had had another, who were given another chance to live their life that they rightly or wrongly considered as, as wow, that was my, my pinnacle in my life. And it is such, an, such a weird thing. You would have thought with all the PTSD, they will never go back. Yet here they are five years later enlisting with the, with the purpose of going back in. How bizarre is that? Well, it's the only life that they'd grown to know. Some, some stayed in continuously. Others, you know, many of the men in the platoon re-upped for for Korea, mm. because that that was comfort. You were around people who understood what it was like. Now that you know, in in just in speaking with you today, it made me realize that most of my father's like, close friends happened to be Marines of his age, not necessarily men that he went to combat with, like Knuppel, but just other fellows that he met after the war that had been on Okinawa. And my dad was not Okinawa 
Okinawa or had served in the Pacific in some way or some old buddies that, that he had. Um, that most of his close friends that he'd, he'd go and do things with and travel with were the Marines because you had that tacit unspoken understanding that you didn't know, whereas everyone else you might kind of might have to feel as though you had to explain something. And for these guys, you know, you, you don't have to do that with your, with your buddy. This exactly does this unspoken rule of brotherhood and the unspoken understanding what someone has gone through in in a weird sense that is actually exactly the same in aa that's the same in with alcoholics or druggies in recovery you recognize someone from from an aa meeting uh and there is a very different connection there yet you have never seen this person yet it is as if a secret handshake uh, is being mm. done here. You know that he knows or she knows, and it is it is so bizarre. And that is a very beautiful thing, a beautiful thing of connection, of having found your tribe. Now, these men literally had found their tribe in a way that we can never imagine unless you have been there, unless you have been in very similar, similar circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we need to say quite clear in, in the wars that were fought in the past, you had a ratio of one to seven. So of, of for those people who were on a spare head, who were having to shoot, there was the one, and then there were seven other uh, people to support that one man, the logistics, the drivers, the admin people, all that. So only because someone has been in the army doesn't mean to say that they have been exposed to combat, but far too many have. And here we have got a select group of 40 men who were not just combat, but ongoing night after night after night killing in the most primeval way. So therefore, this is not the tip. This is the molecule on the tip of the tip of the spearhead. Okay, so this is what we are talking about, about your father there. And can you imagine how how exaggerated their responses were in even in comparison and whilst ptsd is not a pissing contest these guys were so so out there it's no longer funny and that is therefore it is so beautiful to hear you putting these stories in very human words i think that was the other thing that touched me is you i could relate to every single of these men and that's how you laid it out. The chapters are essentially the stories of the man. And it is, mm -hmm. it is absolutely beautiful to read because there was this connection that I could build up in a very lovely way and start understanding those people. But as I said, that, thank you. Mm, that, 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 that was did, beautiful. Yeah, I, did, I always like to say, you know, I, I appreciate it, but it's it's their story, really. They're they're the ones who 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 deserve all the credit. I, Cynthia and I were just, Cynthia Crock is my co-author. She and I were just lucky enough to be the conduit to be able to tell their story. And we wanted to put it in very human terms because we wanted the reader to fall in love with them as their brother, as their son, as their sweetheart, as mm -hmm. their husband, so that when they would you know, be wounded or killed, that it would be more impactful. And, and I'm, you know, I'm very happy that we, we accomplished that. We had a great comment from a, a woman in Montana who said, I never would have bought the book had it not for, been for the Montana connection. Mar Marvin Strombo is, was from Missoula. And she said, it's a, it's a rare depiction of war that neither sugarcoats nor glorifies. And just, Recently, I got uh, a comment from um, a veteran who said, you know, I'm, I'm uh, proud to be a veteran, but uh, I, I served stateside my whole tenure. And after reading this book, it makes me ashamed to call myself a veteran, which, you know, I thought was very sweet. Yeah. Has writing the book changed you and your outlook? Have you become a different husband, a different 
of dead, a different man. What were the lessons you you well, it, it, it incorporated? Is, yeah, it certainly is is eye opening and brings. You know, we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden for a good reason. You know, <laughs> you know we're, we're we're animals, and we're not getting back there anytime soon. And and unfortunately, you know, wars is the way we happen to solve our disputes amongst ourselves. And it's not as though these men had, well, they did have a choice. They they enlisted, but um, it brings about a greater respect for any man or woman who's brave enough to want to serve their countries, um, because it is a thankless task. You know, all of the all of the heroes are guys who play games, you know, play sports, and all of these people are putting their lives literally on the line day in day out. Mm-hmm. Um, and come home changed. Uh, as, as Dad said, you know the um, the loss of an arm or a leg you can learn to live with, but the loss of your soul you might never recover, and you won't know until the day you meet your Maker. Indeed, that quote uh, that quote was speaking so much to me because it is it is exactly that, and and. We are talking here about the generation. Your dad fought in Saipan. That was 1944. And you think, oh, for crying out loud, nowadays it's so different. Well, no. I've had enough veterans on the show now to understand that really, only in the last maybe 10, 15 years, things got maybe a touch, a little bit better. And that is for those people maybe who actually um, have finished their four years of duty and are now transitioning in a more or less structured way uh, into society. Maybe for that subgroup, it has gotten a bit better. But if you're fighting, 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 and suddenly on the receiving end of a machine gun, and then you wake up in a hospital stateside, well, there is no transition. There is, I'm a man, I can kick ass to, oh, I'm missing a leg. And I'm an absolute mess. So there is no transition. And that was not different in 1944. And it was not different in 2021. There is, nowadays, there are more support services there. And there's a a better recognition of what is happening. But the individual journey of transformation that is waiting for every single man and woman who is finding him or herself in that particular scenario. And there are so many of them out there, so many. And that's the weird thing as an anesthetist, we have learned so much in the last 20 years about regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia means that you give local anesthetic to nerves in a clever way so the pain goes. Why have we learned so much? Because of the allied efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq because all these conflicts re, uh, caused a much improved body armor. So that is, people don't die as easily, but their arms still get ripped off. Their legs still get ripped off. And that's why we learned what you can do close to the battlefield, put clever catheters somewhere up here, and then it doesn't matter for the soldier that there is no more arm. The pain is gone. It's numb. Great. So if you actually look at the implications, what that really means, we have learned shitloads because there were 8,000, 10,000, 20,000 amputees in the last 20 years alone from battlefield injuries. These are all lives. These are all men who are right now going through that, those transitions. And for many of them, they're still caught in the darkness of PTSD in those, in those horrible times when you don't know, when you cannot make sense of your suffering and cannot make sense of your of the emotions that wash over you like crazy waves in a in a in a in a most horrifying ocean you could find yourself in. And that is that is not changed. The the suffering of of each of these people is still the same. And you don't have to see your your, your the guts of your friends lying over the the branches. It doesn't have to be that. PTSD can be triggered by much, much less. But the severity of the PTSD for this particular person is still horrendous. And I think that's what I want to bring home. PTSD is a very normal 
not normal, is an, an, a very unfortunate consequence of, for example, major traffic accidents. One in three people, survivors of a, of a really nasty road crash, will have PTSD. Um, women who have been sexually assaulted will have PTSD. Um, those kind of things. There are so many reasons. And I think that is so important because we can learn from your father's story so much. We can learn how this generation often failed to deal with it, how a whole society has failed to deal with it, and what we can nowadays do to, to, to drain the pus out of these wounds, to, to help these men and women move on in their life. And that is by bringing things out of the shadows, talking about those emotions, talking about what has occurred in a safe environment, uh, in, in being transparent and showing that those emotions that you're so ashamed of, that you're going through right now, are actually so normal. And people that you look up to are actually having exactly the same or worse. And that was so important for me when I went into rehab, I looked around at other people thought, wow, you too? I, 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 I could have not imagined that this is, and that is such a beautiful thing. So if we can just actually demystify PTSD and demystify mental health problems and talk about it honestly, this would have helped these men so much. And they would have prevented so much secondary suffering that we see in the stories of, of the 40 thieves of Saipan. Um, all of them were a mess in the in the years after after the war, and no one did want to know about it. People wanted to move on. Yeah, yeah the war is finished. Let's yeah, let's let's rock and roll. Um, that's right. And suddenly these men they couldn't go dancing with their sweethearts. They they lived a very different life in their head. And I think that is what we can learn a lot. So your book is exemplary and it's, it was a really good reading. And maybe, maybe there are veterans who are listening to that, um, who, who maybe want to see a different, different perspective. Guys go out there. Or if you're living, uh, if, if you were touched about the, by the behavior of someone in your family that with hindsight, you think, huh, Okay, now I understand. I think this, uh, Joseph, your book is is likely to help people understand the reality of anyone who has been in armed conflict at the very brutal end and what is happening in their head and why they then behave the way they did behave maybe in, in the viewers or listeners' past to them as children or as partners, etc. Thank you. Mm. I hope so. Joseph, you now thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming onto my show and 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 uh, and telling us about about your father, about Ski and about about all the other men um and for for creating this beautiful this beautiful book. But also for keep Keep, keep writing this journey, so to speak, because other people will come out and will talk. And that's that's exactly what it should be like. You yeah. open up to, about these horrible experiences so that others can gain strength and can gain hope and, and those kind of things and can uh, maybe move on in their life, deal mm -hmm. with with their past. And I think your your book is helping probably quite a lot of people, far more than you can probably imagine. Oh, that would be that would be a wonderful thing, and I I would be happy for that. Happy mm. for that. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned before, how the book keeps getting you know rewritten all the time. I'm going to be going to Hawaii in November to visit the graves of the fellows that were buried there, um, who were killed on Saipan, the National Cemetery of the Pacific. Back in those days, the family would have to pay five hundred dollars to get their child's body sent home. And that was about maybe two years pay back in those days. Uh, it was a lot of money back then. But one of the things I wanna do when I'm there is go to the village of Polalu. You, you would know this because you've read the book and see if any of those girls are still alive and what their memories might be when this 
supply, you know, comes into their village because they were there for quite some time and lived it up, you know, quite illegally. Oh, God. So that's uh, uh, one, one of the things that uh, I'm looking forward to when I go to Hawaii <laughs> is if any of the girls of Polo might still be around. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, it's simple. They were they go they went for some training and some some pre uh, uh there's a word for it. Basically, uh, get them get him used to the tropics, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything worked together there. And but of course, these were young men full of testosterone. And there were a lot of young ladies there on that island. Um, and of course. Um, young people do what young people do. So here you go. So there's a whole all other part to that story. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, you you need to tell me. I need to I need to know from you. Maybe we keep I'm, that off off the airwaves. Uh, but figure out <laughs> 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 these women were young ones too. The question yeah. is, I don't know about the, the Hawaiian society if if they are if they would admit it to it. Uh, it's right. right. It, it's certainly when you when you read the the memoirs of the German soldiers and their training, etc. Whilst there was a very regimented thing and very disciplined in 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 many cases, they were still young men and they did what young men did. And suddenly you look at grandma never the same way again because she also did what she did. So <laughs> and it is it is hmm okay. Sometimes we keep forgetting that because these are uh, these are just old people sitting in a wheelchair. No, they were young ones. They were 20, they were 19, and they lived their life to the fullest under those circumstances. However, however strange those circumstances were. Maybe that's a that that is a wonderful story for me, because as a doctor, I see all these elderly people. And in reality, I always imagine them. How would you look like when you are 20? What were you up to when you're 20? And it's sometimes I get the privilege of hearing their stories. And without fail, I, I'm left amazed. And that's yeah. really some something really for the younger people listening to us. Don't just chuck your the memories of your dad and granddad. Yeah, these old people, old people. Uh, no, they, they were young ones. And if you only knew how cool they were when they were young, maybe that would give you a different respect of the generations that came before you and they which may still live around you. If you get the chance, ask questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though I've met all most of the men as 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 old men, I will always remember them as their sepia tone images from their 1940s <laughs> photographs. Um, How beautiful so is that? That's the way they will live in my memory. And you do wonderful things. Thank you so much for having me on today, Stephen. You do wonderful, Stephen, you do wonderful work. And I mm. appreciate it. I oh, appreciate being on your show. An absolute pleasure. And, um, look after yourself. Bye. Thank you. Dream.